excited to be here tonight with y'all. And I know y'all, the last time I was here, none of y'all wanted to see me. And so I know you probably don't want to hear from me either tonight, but that's all right. I brought my family this time, and so I know many of you saw my wife and our, and our kids, and uh, I know some of you were thinking, right? Uh, we have a blonde hair, a black hair, and we have two red hair children. Now, how did that happen? Well, I'll tell you how it happened. No, I'm just kidding. Either way, we have two redheads, and we have our, of course, Maddie, Callie. Many of you know who they are. And uh, Josiah, he was about, I believe, three to four months when we, uh, when we left. And then Carrie, this is the first time many of you are meeting her. Uh, but I, I count it, I, like I said, a privilege. And uh, serving God is exciting, isn't it? Amen. It really is. Some of you didn't say amen. amen. Serving God's exciting, isn't it? There, there you go. It's better. Uh, it really is. And uh, I know many of you were out doing other things, Sunday school teachers, on the bus routes today. Uh, of course, some who are leading songs, playing piano, all those things, you know, we may think it's in vain. Uh, you know, you do the same thing over, you pick up a kid or you may knock on a door and they may not show up and uh, you may think, am I doing this and is it actually working or what's happening here? But as you see, as you look around, God is doing the work here and that's amazing. It's a blessing. And uh, if you're not part of it, I would encourage you to get part of it. And uh, my wife and I, we had a, a great four and a half years working here. And uh, we wouldn't trade that for the world. And, of course, uh, it's just uh, now we're in New York. And uh, I was get, being asked questions today about what's, what's happening there in New York. If you don't know where we are, we are upstate New York, all right? So we're pretty much close to Canada, A, all right? And so uh, that's where we are. We get bombarded with snow. I was not ready for that. I'm, a, I'm used to the ice of Evansville. And then you go to where we live and literally... I mean, we got at least four foot, four feet this year of snow, uh, and some of it just dumped overnight, and then some of it was just accumulated from the other days, uh, and so I wasn't used to that, uh, and then, uh, you know, but God is doing a work there at our church, and it's a blessing, and I, I said it this morning, but we took over a, a rebuild. The church was without a pastor for three years, and uh, my wife and I, we were praying, uh, about where God would have us to go. We had a, a, it came down to about two churches that were asking us to come. One was in Pennsylvania. The other one was, of course, the church we're at now. And uh, we wanted, we, I asked the Lord to give us peace about it, where he wanted us to go. And the Lord placed us in Mount Morris, New York. And uh, if any of y'all want to come visit us, it's a beautiful spot. Uh, there's Letchworth State Park. Any, any of y'all know where that is? or what that is, Letchworth State Park. Well, it's the number one state park in the state of New York. That's literally at least three minutes from our church. Uh, Niagara Falls is about an hour and a half from us. We're about 30 minutes south of uh, Rochester. And so it's a beautiful area. A lot, we, I, think we, I believe we have about half a million people who come through each and every year between uh, now and fall just to see some of the, the, the park and then seeing leaves fall. And so it's a, a vibrant place. It's, it's happening there. The sad part is there's no independent fundamental Baptist churches. We are the only one. And so it's wide open. And so, like I said this morning, we are praying to start up a bus ministry. And, uh, again, it's wide open. Nobody knows what door knocking is, soul winning, bus ministry. And so it's a blessing to see that. And, uh, and also, as I said this morning, we just hired an assistant pastor. And, honestly, just to see God uh, grow our church, it's been a blessing. And so continue praying for us, if you would, please. If it's your first time meeting us, I'm sorry. Uh, I am not Pastor Russ. Uh, and I know Brother Ed was trying to hold back some words. He was like, you know, Pastor went off to go preach, and we're stuck with this guy. I love you, Brother Ed. All right, did you find your place there in Haggai? All right, good. I wanted to piggyback off what Pastor was going off this morning. He talked a lot about the, the temple or the, the, uh, in, in Ezra. And I wanted to really piggyback off of that and take us to this book of Haggai because it talks a lot about, it pre pretty much they combine together, they join together. And what they do is, they, it makes sense of what's happening at the time. And so there in Haggai chapter number one, let me give you uh, some back history first before I get into this. The first nine books of the minor prophets, those are pre-exile. And so either they're pre, meaning before Babylon comes in, or they're actually in uh, the, the, the captivity of Babylon. 
And so when we get to Haggai, the last three minor books, which is Haggai, and then you have, of course, the other two, uh, then what we have is is called post-exile. And so they are now coming from Babylon and going back into Jerusalem. And so when Haggai is written, it's about September. Of course, we have some dates there. As you see in the second year of Darius, the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month. And what goes on in this, uh, in Haggai, there's about three uh, sermons that he preaches. Because he realizes that the people, they're back from Babylon. They're back in Jerusalem, and nothing is happening with the temple. There, he, he's noticing, and of course, not just him, but God sees this. You're, you're okay doing what you want to do, but when it comes to the things of God, you're not doing them. And so when we get to the book of Haggai, Haggai is really going to get them pretty much going. Hey, let's build this thing. Let's build this thing. Let's get going. You've been sitting long enough. Let's go. Let's do something. And so let's begin reading in verse number one. In the second year of Darius, the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, Josedek, uh, the high priest, saying, Thus speak the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not yet come, the time that the Lord's house shall be built. Then came the word of the Lord unto Haggai the prophet, It is... Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in the, ho- in the sealed houses, and his house lie waste? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts. And I want us to really get this tonight, because he says this twice in verse number 5 and verse number 7. He says, consider your ways. Consider your ways. Ye have sown much, and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye uh, have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And ye earneth wages, uh, and earneth wages to put into a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. And I want to preach tonight just on that, consider your ways. Now this is a, a two-part. I'm going to try to put it into uh, together, uh, and I w- promise I'll get us out on time tonight, but you came to church tonight, meaning you had nothing else to do, so you came to, to listen to me, so if I get done, I get done, if I don't, all right, I'll take it, Brother Sonny, thank you, I was waiting for somebody to say that, but I, I promise I'll, I'll get done, uh, I won't be long, so when we get into this, Haggai gets this sermon from the Lord, I have to move, I think y'all know that, I, I have to move around, all right, I'm not a pulpit guy, so when we get into the book of Haggai, again, we're introduced September 1st. Uh, that's what I will say that the month is and the date uh, of what's happening uh, is happening here. And it's 520 B.C. In 538 B.C., we have uh, Cyrus who tells him, hey, you can leave Babylon and go back to your homeland. And by 520, if we do our math right, it's about 18 years. So as these children are now leaving the exile of Babylon, they're coming out of that after their 70 years of captivity, they're going back to their homeland, and God then speaks to them because he realizes something. You've been out for 18 years. My temple is laying in waste, but your houses look really good. Your your things that you want done, they're done. And you can walk and you can look around and the temple that used to be beautiful that was arrayed in gold and that was uh, brought with the pillars and and, and had the the, the porch there and that was so beautiful back in the day. And now we're to a point where you're back, the temple is laying waste, there's nothing there, everything is gone because your priorities are mixed up. Hey, consider your ways. Consider your ways. What has gone from the old time of uh, of Jerusalem? Well, gone was the glory of the temple. Gone was that great population. And what was left was rubble of Jerusalem. What was left was a remnant of the people. And what was left was the restoration of the land. All these things were to, they, they were gone out of the land for 70 years, come back to rubble. They come back, and just like anybody who's doing a home project, you know, Brother Phil is working on one right now. It's not fun. Restoring something to its old glory takes a lot of work. 
And so when the Lord is speaking to Haggai, Haggai, you got to get them, encourage them, go, tell them, consider your ways, because your priorities are messed up. Why, we may ask ourselves, why? Did they say back in verse number two, the time has not yet come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Hey, they, they like the idea of building something, just not the timing. 18 years? Is, isn't that long enough? 18 years it's been lying there. Don't you think it's time now to go do something for God? So let's do this. Let's consider our ways. Number one, let's look at the procrastination. Find that again in verse number two. It says, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not yet come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Procrastination, of course, is defined as putting off something or to delay. The question that Haggai had for these people is, When will you serve the Lord? When will God be more important than your watch? Because the, the sad part about this, hey, God's coming. Haggai, tell those people it's time to build this thing. And they're like, what are you talking about? Time's not yet. It's not time yet. I don't know who told you the time, but my time says not yet on there. I, there there's more time we have, but I'm just telling you right now that I, I don't want to do this. And so... Don't have time yet. Maybe later. Give me more time. Sorry, I'm booked. And our time sometimes gets in the way and we procrastinate. When God is saying this, hey, consider your ways. We only have so much time here on this earth to do something for God and yet we're procrastinating. We're wasting our time. Well, I'm, I'm booked. I can't do it today. It's not time yet. And maybe later, hey, come back to me when, when, when somebody else is, is done and, and maybe I can fill in for that. How many of us have been there? The disciples, we look at their life, and they could not pray for an hour, but hey, they sure can go fishing. They were falling asleep while, while Jesus was praying. Would you pray for me about an hour? And they're falling asleep. Falling asleep. But man, they can sure go out fishing and catch some, or try to catch some fish. Spend hours doing that. We're like that, aren't we? When it's the things we want to do. When it's the things that, uh, that, that seem so great to us, we can say, God, I don't care about the things that you want us to do because guess what? It's not time yet. But for the things I want, it's time. We procrastinate. Consider your ways. Consider your ways. If I had more help, I'll serve. If I had more money, I'll serve. If I had more time, I'll serve. These people gave all these excuses. Why did they say it's not time yet? Well, because the land was neglected for 70 years. Brother Steve, you talked about some grass that was up really tall. We, probably in the passing, I don't know if you remember, but I remembered it just from us talking before church. Cutting some grass down. That's hard to do, isn't it, when it's high up there? Just imagine 70 years of a desolate land. Now you have weeds grown up, 70 years worth of weeds. Rubble that's been lying there, and just think of all the animals that moved in. So why was it, why did they say, hey, the timing's not yet? Because the portion of the land, it still needed to be developed. Another thing, the work is hard. Removing rubble, building something, getting your family back in order. Now you're coming out of this exile. Hey, I need to get my family set before we can do anything for God. You guys say there's nothing wrong with family. I love my family. Man, if our priorities, our priorities. Another one in verse number six, we look at this and it says, well, why, why, so why did they say it's not time yet? Why did they procrastinate? Well, they also, they were broke. They had no money to do this stuff. The temple back, they, they gave everything they possibly could. They gave their gold. They gave all that they could to God. And yet here, God tells them, hey, you don't need gold. You don't need the silver. I, do you, not for, do you forget who I am? I'm God. Hey, I own the cattle on a thousand hills. Hey, the gold and the silver, that's nothing for me. I just need you to stop procrastinating and get to work. God was saying to these folks, hey, get going. Yes, you may be broke, but you have God on your side. There was a drought also in the land. 
you look at verse number 10 and 11, he brought a drought and says, and I called for a drought upon the land and upon the mountains, upon the corn and upon the new wine and, and upon the oil. And so they're like, well, Lord, we can't build this thing back up because there's a drought. You notice all these excuses they're using? They're procrastinating. They're killing time. The Lord's telling them, hey, consider your ways. Secondly, tonight, I see this in verse number four. Not only do I see procrastination, but I see passivity. They're passive. Verse number four says, is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in sealed houses and this house lie waste? Now, the house is, is what he, this is what it's talking about. Passivity, of course, is like having no care. So as these people, they're coming in. They're coming in from Babylon, and I'm, they're taking all that they have, right? Cyrus lets them go, and so they're, they're coming back with their little stick and you know, their handkerchief with what they've got. And they're walking into Jerusalem, and they're saying, all right, here we go. And the first thing they think about, of course, they may pass by the rubble. Some of them, as it, the story goes on in the, in the Word of God, it talks about how those who have seen it back in its glory days and how beautiful it was, but how the, the, the other, the, that land, how that temple used to be, the new temple was going to be greater than that one. And so as they're coming back in, the first thing that comes to their mind is not, build the temple. It's not do anything for God. Their first priority is I need to get my house ready. I got to get my family set. I, I have to make sure that my, my family's going. And so the passivity, it's not a wrong thing that you want to take care of your family, but man, those houses that they're talking about, that was the most expensive wood you can possibly get. I mean, their houses, as the Bible's talking about, you want to let God's house lie in waste but man, look at all this beautiful cedar you have all in your house. Look at all this stuff that you have in your house. You're saying that you don't have time and you want to procrastinate, but at the end of the day, you really just don't care. You just really don't care about doing things for God. You're okay letting God's house lie waste? You're okay letting the things of God just say, well, we'll do it later, we're okay with it? Their passivity, they could care less. Many of us may ask ourselves, why does it matter? Who really cares? We care more for our needs and wants, and we could care less about the things of God. That's our passivity. We invest so much in this world that we forget to invest in the things of God. That's what they were doing. They invested in their houses. They invested in their things while God's house lied in waste. I, honestly, I'm thinking that they would pass by it every day. Kids probably playing on it. I mean, thinking it's a jungle gym or whatever it may be. I'm, I know I'm, I may be adding some things because it's not in the word of God, but I'm just thinking in my head what, what we may have going on and was mom and dad calls them back, Jimmy, come in, mom. They come back to this beautiful, fabulous house while they're just playing on rubble. The passivity. Do you care about the things of God? Uh, do, do you want to see God's work go forward? Uh, do you want to see God do amazing things here at Faithway Baptist Church? Then we got to drop our passivity. Hey, we got to care. Don't just leave it to the bus workers. Don't just leave it to those that go out on Saturdays. Just a handful of folks who go out on a Saturday. You need to care about it, too. Well, that's so-and-so's job. No, 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 that's your job, too. Our passivity. Do you truly care? Because we can hear sermons all we want. We can, we can get hyped up and say, yes, I'm going to do it. And then when it comes down to, well, I have time, and our procrastination then kicks in. But their passivity. Can I tell you this? Where we invest, it does make a difference. Because when you invest in the bus ministry, can I say souls are saved? That should have been bigger. When you invest in the bus ministry, souls are saved. The reason I say that is, of course, many of you know I'm a bus kid. And folks invested in me. But we're, many are too busy investing in other things instead of in the things of God. When we invest in things of God, the church moves forward. How exciting is it to start a Christian school? 
how, how exciting is it to, well, not for me, but for, for y'all to, to, to hire a youth pastor? Just kidding, Phil. Young children learn of Jesus and families live and their lives are changing. Can I say, when we actually care, these things happen. Marriages can be mended. Surrender to God and stop being apathetic. Just surrender to God. God is telling through Haggai, Haggai, tell these folks, consider your ways. Their passivity, their procrastination. And then lastly, their personal profit. We see this in verse number six. Now this is what's really confusing. But these folks have been working and working and working and working and working and working. 18 years now they're back home. They've been working on something. And yet God says, you have sown much and bring in little. He says, ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. You know what he was saying? He was saying there that what you're doing is all for your personal profit. Your personal profit. Your work gets you nowhere in this world. It all leads to not enough. Because here's the thing. You get your house fixed up, now you need the, the newest horse on the block. Get the newest horse on the block. Then there's something else that comes out. And then you need that and need that. And so what God was telling them is this. That hole in that wallet that you have is going to continue to have a hole there. Because whenever you get what you want, you're going to want something else. And by that time you get that thing, God's house is still going to be lying in waste. And so when you look like, oh, I have enough, it's not enough because you want more. And when, you, when God has done all these things, you still will be finding a reason why not to serve me. Consider your ways. The personal profit. Your spirit will never be satisfied until it is filled with the things of God. You notice all these things that were mentioned here, they're all just fleshly and worldly things. None of the thing was filled with God because we understand that when you fill our lives with God, there's no hole in our pocket, is there? Because we're truly filled. But when we try to live our lives for the things of this world, guess what? It all is just like that hole in your little pocket. Put something in. Hey, where'd it go? Well, you dropped it. All right, I got to go get something else. Put it in the same pocket. The kingdom of God should come first before our own personal gains. Pastor, is that Bible? Yes, it is. Think, look at the, the old, in Ezra of when they were building that temple. They gave all that they had for the things of God. That is what God was saying here. He's saying, hey, consider your ways. Faithway Baptist Church, can I, can I just say, would you consider your ways? Is there something maybe in your life where you're just procrastinating. You've heard pastor preach. You've heard pastor ask for some workers, and you're just like, well, somebody else will fill that in. Somebody else will do it. Uh, you know, uh, uh, maybe it's not time for me yet. Maybe later on I can do that. Consider your ways. Maybe you're just passive. And I really don't like saying that people don't care, but God used that here. You guys just don't care about the things of God. Well, I, well, Brother Matt, I, I do care. Well, if you do, then show it. The things of God lying in waste while you're living it up. You need to consider your ways. And then the, perf- the personal profit. Doing things for you and not for God. So real quick, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. That Greek word there really means just put your heart on the roads. Put your heart on your roads. Consider your ways. Giving you a choice to make. And so as Haggai told him this in the first part, from verse number 7 all the way down to verse number 11, God calls them to work. He's saying, hey, consider your ways because your ways, when you come into these things of Babylon, you need to do something because you're passive. You are procrastinating. Everything you do is for your own personal profit. So, hey, consider your ways because those are wicked. But, hey, consider these ways. Get to work. Work. 
Stop allowing my house to lie in waste. Get to work. We see this here in verse number eight. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build a house and I will take pleasure in it and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. He was telling them, get to work. Get to work. You want to consider your ways? Then get to work. You know, I love when we have services and there's an altar call that's been, been said, and, and we'll have some folks that will come. And, and then, uh, you know, you know that the Lord is pricking your heart or, or, or really it, it's speaking to you. And yet you, won't, you just won't move because either you're embarrassed or you know that if you move, you're committing to something. There's nothing wrong with that. Because God wants you to work for him, for his cause. And can I say there is nothing better than working for the Lord. There's nothing better. I would not trade it in for anything at all. I love what I get to do. I really do. He tells them, get to work. He calls them to work. He calls them in verse number nine to worship. And in verse number eight as well, at the, the later end, it says, and I will take pleasure and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Man, isn't that something that I hope we can do? Just worship our Lord. Has God been good in your life? Man, if you're, if you're sitting here today in this, uh, what is it, 72 degrees in here? It's beautiful. That's something to bring glory to God. Some of you looking at the thing, I don't know what it's at. I'm looking from afar. It's probably 72. I don't know. Man, the amenities that we have. Did you worship God today? He wants to be worshipped. He wants that house to be built so that that house itself, can, we can be there so we can worship our God. So consider your ways. And then God calls them to wait. In verse number 11, it says, And I called for a drought upon the land, upon the mountains and upon the corn and upon the new wine, and upon the oil and upon which the ground bringeth forth and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labor of thy hands. You know, many times when we have our priorities, if you would say, out of whack, and we procrastinate, and we have passivity, and we just do everything for our own personal profit, God calls us to wait sometimes until we get our priorities in check. But we would like to well, the reason why this is going on in my life is Satan. If you, look at, if you look closely in the passage, that's what they were doing. There was a drought. There was no corn, no wine, and all this kind of stuff they were, they were working for with their hands. God called for the drought. You want to let my house lay in waste? I'll take some things from you. But we always think it's Satan doing it, but God is like, no, I'm going to call you to wait till you get serious about doing the things for me. Why not just consider your ways and do what God wants? They wondered why all this was going on. Why is there a drought? Why is this happening? Well, because you weren't working for the Lord. So all that, hopefully for us to think and consider our ways. Are you procrastinating on something today? Are you just saying, well, I have all the time. Hey, it's not time yet. My time will come, but my time's not right now. You know, I've seen so many folks. I was, I was preaching a revival earlier this week, Monday and Tuesday in Pennsylvania. And the theme of the conference pretty much was like, we just have short time here on this earth. And we live like we have Forever. Honestly, and we really don't. I don't know how much time all of us have on this earth, but it's going to come sooner or later. Might as well start working for God now, doing what God wants us to do. A little boy who loved his grandfather dearly wanted him to, uh, wanted to help on his farm. The grandfather told him that when he was old enough, he could. Finally, at the age of seven, the grandfather told him he could help. The little boy was so excited, Grandma tucked him in 
early in that night into bed, and after Grandpa said they'd get up early and get busy, the little boy was hard to, to rouse at 4.30 and complained a little that it was still dark outside, but he finally woke up and helped his grandpa milk a few cows they had. Then fed the chickens, the horses, the pigs, and make sure that the dogs had water. At about 7.30, Grandma called them, and they had a huge breakfast. The little boy's eyes were delighted with the sight of bacon and sausage and eggs and nasty grits, biscuits, and even pancakes. He ate until he was full. When he was done, he began to complain that he was really sleepy and he thought he might take a nap. Grandpa said that he couldn't take a nap, that they had to get to work. The little boy protested and that the, the cows were milked and he fed the horses and the pigs and even the chickens. Grandpa said, why, son? Those were only the chores. The real work is in the fields. So the application to his Christians are too much like this little boy. We think that if simply uh, come to Sunday school or, or to church that we have done all that is expected of us, but we don't realize that the real work is in the field. So where are your priorities? Consider your ways. Lord, we thank you so much for this evening. I thank you, Lord, again for this opportunity to preach. Lord, I, I, again, I don't take it lightly what I get to do. Lord, I love to preach and I love to uh, just to speak and Lord, just to deliver your message. Lord, thank you for speaking to me. Lord, there's times in my life I procrastinate. There's some times in my life, Lord, I'm just so passive. I just don't care. And there's sometimes, Lord, I just do things for my own personal profit. Lord, help me to consider my ways. Help me, Lord. For many that are in here tonight, Lord, I just pray, maybe someone is in here procrastinating. And Lord, there's some work to be done here at Faithway Baptist Church. and They could be a help to that work. A school's going to start. There's, there could always be more help on the bus ministry, cleaning the church, nursery workers, Sunday school teachers. The list can go on and on. Lord, I just pray that tonight we'll consider our ways. Help us to work. Help us to worship. And Lord, sometimes, Lord, you'll call us to wait until we get our priorities right. Help us, Lord, to consider our ways. As the piano begins to play, head bows and eyes are closed. Would you stand with me to your feet? I don't know, maybe the Lord spoke to you. Maybe not. Maybe you just weren't there in your seat, but I want to ask, make a decision tonight. Ask the Lord, Lord, please help me not to be so passive. Help me, Lord, not to procrastinate. Help me, Lord, not to do things just for my own personal profit. Maybe there are families you want to pray together and just say, Lord, help us to do things for the things for God. Help us not build up our homes and forget about God. But Lord, please help us consider our ways. Church, to God be the glory, great things he hath done. Amen.
Let's be dismissed in a word of prayer, if we could tonight, please. Our Father in heaven, thank you for the things we've heard. Lord, I thank you for Brother, Brother Matt and Rebecca and their family. And uh, Lord, we, we can't take credit for them here, but Lord, we're so grateful that they were with us for a time, and now they are uh, in New York pastoring a church. And Lord, I pray that you'll bless that church. Lord, I pray, pray that you'll bless their ministry there. Lord, I thank you for them. Lord, thank you for the things we've heard today. And Lord, may we consider our ways and our priorities. We thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Fellowship with some folks for a while. We have an announcement down here. Brother Phil, real quick. I failed to mention this announcement earlier, but we're going to have a quick meeting in about two minutes in the choir room for anyone, any um, teens, college graduates, kindergartners, and their parents who are going to participate next week, but especially for our high school seniors, we just have some information to give there. So that's going to be in about two minutes in the choir room. Amen.